Welcome to our worship service for this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We are so grateful that you have chosen to worship with us today. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Lord of all power and might, Lord of all power and might, who art the author, who art the author, who art the author and giver of all good things, grant in our hearts the love of thy name. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who re rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The Word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may your word become life in our lives. Amen. Elections in our country are just around the corner. The candidates and political parties are already attacking each other, lying about each other, and the people are at the mercy of political campaigns and the press. Elections in our country are just around the corner and therefore the phrase, the church does not get involved in politics, is beginning to be heard more and more. The church does not get involved in politics. It's a phrase that usually appears in the public arena at election time. It doesn't matter how much political work is done during the rest of the four years. In election times, however, it seems that the, it seems that the church is called to keep quiet, to hide itself on the ground, or, or to get away from the noise of the slogans and the political profiles of the candidates. The church does not get into politics, but there are certain religious leaders who turn their pulpit into a political pr platform. Uh, the church does not get involved in politics, but the president's religious advocates demonize his opponents. And, uh, and also he takes out a Bible as if it were a theater props to pose in front of a church and to try to convince uh, Christians to vote for him. At the end, the idea that the church does not get involved in politics represents the dream of a few who think that the church does not belong to this world. That this world we live in is too corrupt for the business of the church to take place in it. But let's be clear, let's not be fooled. The church is part of and must get into politics precisely because the church develops its mission in the police, in the public arena, in the midst of the social relationships that are essential, essential part of who we are as human beings. The church gets into politics because the church proclaims the kingdom of God here and now in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis in full disintegration of the social harmony due to social and economic injustice amid ongoing political campaigns as we are right now. The church gets involved in politics because we are part of it and because we are political human beings by nature, 
whether we are citizens of this country or not, whether we belong to or vote for a specific party or not, whether we refrain from exercising our voting rights or not. And precisely because the church lives, acts, worships, and transforms itself in the midst of this messy and unstable reality, the church is a part of this whole political environment on a daily basis. Jesus himself made clear with his actions and words the political connotation of his identity as the Messiah. In today's gospel, Jesus is clear, clear enough when he denounces to his disciples that his death in Jerusalem would not occur on heavens or in an, or in an inaccessible spiritual place. His death would be organized and executed by the Jewish and Roman political authorities of his time and through the Roman punishment for revolutionaries and opponents of the empire, the cross. A cruel, cruelly political death for a deeply political man like Jesus. The pain, the punishment, the murder of a spiritual leader at the hands of the political and religious forces that still today continue to silence the voices of resistance. And in the midst of the powers and the parties, in the midst of the political executions and political campaigns devoid of meaning and truth, we are called to be disciples. To be disciples not in the thereafter, not in the private place of our souls or hearts, to be disciples in the polis, in the midst of daily and chaotic life, to be disciples of Jesus in the middle of the electoral campaign, in the midst of uh, the massacre of African Americans, in the midst of a crisis of leadership and purpose. And it is precisely here, in the midst of the, this reality, from which we often, often want to escape, that we are called to be the disciples of Jesus. It is in the midst of this disconcerting reality that we are called to carry the cross that heals, that oppresses, that punishes, to turn it into an instrument of discipleship, of follow, of witness. It is true that when we read or listen to the gospel today, we can discover a certain atmosphere of sobriety. Whoever wants, wants to save his life will lose it, to lose our soul, to deny yourself, to take up the cross. Matthew presents an idea of discipleship that is related to suffering and martyrdom. Many other texts in the gospel also hint at this idea of the need to offer public witness of our faith through concrete actions that can lead to persecution or death. And many times we wonder how much the Christians did in the first century to deserve so much punishment to be killed like Jesus on the cross, or to be persecuted by the Roman legions? What sin did that mi minority group of early Christians commit that caused so much anger in the political and religious classes and leaders of the time? They had no weapons to fight the well-funded Roman army. They did not have large groups of people to force things to change. They did not have large sums of money to access resources or leadership positions. At some point, they didn't even have places to meet other than their own homes. What then was the danger of that small group of disciples of Jesus? 
what power did they have? So there was so much hatred and anger against them. They had precisely an ethic of life, daily practices of communion that in themselves condemned and subverted the unjust order established by their enemies. Faced with segregation of castes and classes, the Christian community in the first century promoted equality between women and men, slave and free, Jews and Gentiles. Faced with the imposition of the imperial power of Caesar and his represent representatives, the Christian community worshipped only Christ as the Lord, to whom only obedience and adoration were owed. Faced with the promotion of a religiosity hijacked by commercialism and division, the Christian community professed a faith based in love, forgiveness, and justice. Faced with religious legalism that forgot the human being and human needs, the Christian community presented the human being as the image of God and as the center of God's revelation. Faced with economic injustices, slavery, and in innumerable taxes that looted families and individuals, the Christian community promoted the common life, the common table, God's grace accessible to all, and the sharing of goods with the entire community. The church of the first century, although far from being perfect, attempted to be a political alternative to the oppressive power of Rome and the temple in Jerusalem. But her daily actions of faith, love, and solidarity were so profound that in themselves they unmasked the state of politics of that time. The church involved in politics by removing Caesar's status as Lord. The church embroiled in politics by subverting slave skins in the community of equals. The church involved in politics by promoting solidarity, forgiveness, and justice as centers of its creed and practices. And even today, Jesus continues to call us as his disciples to carry the same crosses. Still today, we are still called to live our faith and to exercise our witness in the middle of the public square, the streets, our homes, where we live our faith daily. If he's not in the middle of this chaotic, messy political world, our faith is meaningless. Our discipleship is meaningless. It is precisely here where we are called to live just relationships, to love without limits or barriers, to vote for those who represent us best, and to transform the small spaces where we live into small reflections of the kingdom of God. Only here, right now, in dialogue with our own messy reality. Amen. O oh God, you shape our dreams. As we put our trust in you, may your hopes and desires be ours and we, your expectant people. Amen. We pray for those who make decisions about the resources of the earth, that we may use your gifts responsibly while expanding life among us. We pray for the people of St. Albans and for all communities of faith around the world. Grant us all the courage to take up our crosses and to live faithfully our call. Amen. We pray for those who work on the land and sea, in city and in industry, 
and especially for those who are struggling without the resources they need to sustain themselves and their families. We pray for those who've been deprived of their rights and liberties because of their race, religion, gender, or sexual identity. Amen. We pray for artists, scientists, and visionaries, that through their work we can find hope and solace in the common future for humanity. We pray for all who through their own or others' actions are deprived of fullness of life, for prisoners, refugees, the handicapped, and all who are sick, especially for those suffering from coronavirus. We pray especially for those in need in our congregation, Arturo Manzo, Beatrice Montgomery, Virginia Foster, Eric Bradley, Matilda Beals, Armando Pineda, Penny Glass, Robin Huddleston, Steve Bergen, Molly Fisk, Malin Hoagland, Bruce Barrow, John Lane, Alejandra Matos, Ann Carter, Holly Tank, and Linda Chandler. Amen. We give thanks for new life wherever we find it. This day, giving thanks for the safe birth of Sharon Chang. And we pray for all who have died in our community, our nation, and throughout the world. Remembering especially Jenny Cutliffe, Elizabeth Babbitt, John Digney, and Oscar Medina. May their souls and the souls of all the departed rest in God's peace. Amen. God of peace, let us, your people, know that at the heart of turbulence, there is an inner calm that comes from, your, from faith in you. Keep us from being content with things as they are, that from this central peace there may come a creative compassion, a thirst for justice, and a willingness to give of ourselves in the spirit of Christ. Amen. Gracious God, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully may, may we obtain effectually for the sake of your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let us pray in the words our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has taught us. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful Lord, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned in thought, thought word, and deed. We, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. At the end of this recording, you will see an opportunity to make a financial offering to the ministry of this parish. Please know how honored and humbled we are by your generosity. Your generosity has enabled us to remain generous and responsive to the needs of this community and um, folks throughout the world. So thank you. Also, at the bottom of this YouTube recording, you'll see a link to an online welcome card. So if you are new or joining us for the first time or just curious and interested in learning more about us, we would love to know more about you and see how we can best support you in your life of faith. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. 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 Alleluia.